Hello everyone and thanks for joining me today to talk about what I have to admit is my favourite uh, subject in chemistry which is structure and bonding so I'm really really looking forward to hearing all of your thoughts on how you teach it and how you think it should be taught. Um, so do you want to introduce yourselves quickly Michael do you want to start? Um, I'm Michael Dunique and I'm the Head of Science at St Bonaventure School in Forest Bay, Islam. I've been teaching for seven years now. Thank you. And Elizabeth? Um, I'm Elizabeth Mount Stevens. I teach at Sir John Laws in Hertfordshire. I've been teaching for, I think, about ten years now. Brilliant. And Adam? Robbins. Uh, I'm a Head of Science at the Regis School and I also had the uh, luxury of being Oak National Academy teacher for the structures and bonding topic. So I've already spent most of my holiday thinking about this one. Um, so it's good to get back to the well. Yeah, it'll be really interesting to hear from that uh, perspective as well. So I'm Nikki Kaiser. I'm a chemistry teacher um, and I'm also seconded at the moment to the Education Endowment Foundation as their science content specialist. So, right, structure and bonding then. Um, Thinking about the times that we've taught it, what are the bits that students find most tricky, do you find? Yeah. <laughs> right, I'll, I'll kind of I'll chip and start. Um, there's, a, there's a number of different things I kind of wrote down and thought about. Um, I think simply to do the breadth of what structure and bonding is in the first place is quite a a uh, daunting thing if you think about you're dealing not only with the prerequisite knowledge you need in terms of atomic structure and electronic structure as well um, then it feeds into you need to understand different types of bonding uh, link bonding to structure link bonding and structure to physical properties um, then we've got the whole idea of intermolecular forces as well which we do touch upon potentially early on in the course if you teach AQA but then you need to bring that back into your explanations again when you're te teaching about simple molecular structures. There's so many little things that you've got to consider throughout the course of the topic um, that that makes it difficult for, for students just in terms of the amount of content maybe compared to other chemistry units. And I feel on top of that terminology is a, is a huge thing. Um, often when we're discussing science we kind of attribute it sometimes to teaching biology but I note it down for myself if you just look at the OUP textbook You've got all of these different terms that students don't understand. Delocalized, fullerenes, covalent, ionic, metallic, bonding, lattice, polymers, intermolecular. Um, talking about giant structures when we're actually talking about stuff that's really small. <laughs> <laughs> um, so all of that terminology which you've got to understand and uh, be able to explain explicitly adds to the challenge in the course. And then the uh, final thing that I've got is that you've got to understand all of this on both the macroscopic and the microscopic level. Um, one of my, I, I'm lucky enough to teach the uh, separate sciences class uh, this year and one of my students did mention to me, so isn't it a bit of an oxymoron to call something giant when it's actually really, really small? <laughs> Which is something I never considered um, until they mentioned it in class. Um, and if you consider that to our students in general as well, that's another challenge and difficulty in terms of understanding the topic. I think you're completely right about the language. I often wonder when they write something like um, something has a low boiling point because its covalent bonds are weak, whether they honestly think that they're honestly confused about which bonds are breaking. So whether they think actually the atoms are breaking up from the molecules or they've just forgotten the word and they're not used to using language in the precision that we need them to use it. Um, so that they probably, they may in their head have the right idea that the, the molecules are moving apart and not breaking up but maybe they just haven't taken care to use the right word they haven't stopped to think about it they haven't got the metacognitive skill to say hey hang on a minute i'm going to get this wrong if I, unless i'm careful um, and i think one thing that you can do is to perhaps get them to draw their explanations rather than just write them with the words and then sometimes i think you can tell the difference between a language problem and an actual misconception which i'm sure we'll come on to you also get the situation where um, students get drilled that certain language is really important, so they just throw it against the wall when it comes to an example. <laughs> um, they'll, just, they'll just bung anything in that sounds posh so that they think they've got a better chance of getting the mark that way. I do think one of the things with structures and bonding, one of the things I find myself um, saying to my students a lot is, 
structures and bonding is chemistry when it comes to GCSE. If they can do structures and bonding, then everything else becomes so much easier for them. You know, people talk about and people write about electrolysis being difficult to understand. It's only difficult to understand if you don't have a really good grasp of structures and bonding. If you get the structures and bonding right, then everything can be scaffolded on top of that so easily. I really agree with you. And, and we put hours at the beginning of, of year 10 for that, for that reason, after we've done atomic structure. I know not everybody does, but I, I've always taught bonding at the beginning because I think, well, you, you've got to understand that. But I was going to say, building on what Michael and Elizabeth said as well about the, not just the languages, but we start to kind of dip into A-level stuff, don't we? So we talk about intermolecular forces, but we don't actually talk about those in depth. So it's just another label that you have to learn without really understanding what they are. And, and so I think I agree with you, Michael, that there's a lot, a lot, a lot of different things that you learn and you kind of get one thing sorted and then you move on to another idea and then it's slightly changed because it's bonding, but it's a different kind of bonding. Um, but on the other hand, you don't go into enough depth for some things to actually really appreciate what's going on. So a lot is covered without that depth. So yeah, I think, what about particular, if you had to pick out the, you know, one little kind of part of it that, that's always a stumbling block, can you say what you think it is for you? I think Elizabeth's example of um, combining physical changes with structure and bonding is a place where a lot of students even the most able students can fall foul. Um, something I've come across in recent years using the localized electrons to explain all um, all forms of electricity. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's because that that's how they first come across electricity. So it's very ingrained that electricity is electrons, and I think it's very hard for them to suddenly remember not to write that for one particular example, because still most of the time in chemistry. Um, in the examples we do at Key Stage 4, it's still electrons moving. It's only when we come to molten ion solutions of ionic compounds that it's anything else. But it, I think it just, it, because it's a very, it, it's been practiced, it's been retrieved a lot, it, it's a very fluent knowledge, electrons is electricity, and it's all connected in the word. I think they write that before they even stop to think about it. It's, it's like fast thinking. Um, and That's a bit of a shift. That is a real shift, isn't it? And when you're talking about electrolysis as well, to go from that, like you say, the electrons in a wire being electricity, which is, you know, their first experience of it, to actually it's the flow of charge and it, it could actually just be these ions in solution or it could be, you know, that kind of suddenly changing everything around. It is these, it's what feels to a student like a U-turn, isn't it? It's, it's mm. what we've talked before about models when you say, you know that awful thing where people say forget everything you learned at GCSE it's all different now well it's not but this is just a further example this is a deeper example and so on and I think you know that's a really good example of where they have to kind of let go of things that they previously felt quite comfortable with and and I agree with you with, about the, the giant thing as well because you know we we talk a lot or I talk a lot definitely about this idea of different conceptual levels in in chemistry and how the you know the sub microscopic and you have to relate that to symbols and the things that you see and suddenly we're, we're using this term giant to mean something that is, is so it, it's that conceptual level again and, and and how isn't it so so kind of moving on from that I mean it's I guess it's connected um, but there are certain preconceptions and misconceptions that, that students are likely to hold before you teach them and that they'll encounter as they go through the topic so I mean what do you do about this what do you do this before you enter the classroom what do you do while you're in the classroom is there anything you do afterwards what, what's your approach to things like this I think one of the common ones is the ionic molecule and I think a lot of that comes from how we teach them at key stage three and we do a lot of writing of formulae of ionic compounds but that doesn't come with the idea that behind that is a giant lattice and they're used to seeing um, NaCl and they probably in their heads think um, okay that means one sodium one chlorine um, and certainly that's something I've been thinking about quite a lot this summer as to how to change how I teach it at, at Key Stage 3 to embed that a bit more. So I think something to do at the start of the topic is, is to investigate sort of 
of that sort of idea. So when they think of salt, how do they think the particles are arranged? Um, and I don't know whether, I don't, I've never done that absolutely first before. I think I've always done it after I've taught them a bit. Um, but um, after perhaps I introduced the, um, the arrangement of ions, so we've done ions and then we do these ions packed together to form a lattice. Um, and at that point, um, this year I asked them to, I did a bit of, uh, a bit of model making, we got some plasticine out, we made some models, but I asked them to break them up and show me what they thought happened when they melted and show me what they thought happened when they dissolved in water to try and get a handle on whether they are thinking that these particles go around in pairs when they do that or whether they are properly breaking them all up into sort of different ions. And quite interestingly, my year 10 group when they did that, when we were in the midst of teaching and talking about ionic compounds, they did. They broke them all up exactly as they should. We hadn't talked about what happened. So they, they did it probably just because they're used to breaking them all up when they think about solids to liquids. And they put their waters in and that was all fine. But when I asked my, um, my year 11, um, both, um, both able groups, when I asked my year 11 the next, uh, later on in the term, and sort of they'd done it a year ago, there was a lot of ionic molecules that appeared. So I think it's just, again, it's something that they, they overcome when you teach it initially. And then uh, you check it. I love, I'm sure Nikki's going to say this as well, but I love the RSC um, questions and true or false questions. Um, you can sort it out in year 10, but it is going to come back because somewhere in there, because I think they're used to seeing these two things paired together, it just they just slip back into it. In, so in, the same, keep doing. in the same way that I've marked year 13 mocks and covalent bonding between things like beryllium chloride and things like that. And I'm thinking, how how can you revert back to that? And and I understand it because there, there are these things that are so ingrained. Um, but yeah, th I think that 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 idea that once it's understood, that's forever is is one that we have to let go of. And you're right. And you have to keep checking it and keep reminding. And I think once they then come across covalent and kind of and and I think the covalent molecules come across they come across them in so many other topics, I think, that they're used to kind of this idea of molecules again. So, it, yeah, I've, I've, I've also done the thing of, my technicians hate me because I've take, I have a lattice, the whole thing, you know that lattice model that everyone's got, the sodium chloride lattice model in their lab, and I'm always pulling it apart and chucking the irons around the room because, it, you know, you, you have to get this, somehow make it more visual don't you and 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 then put it back together again um what about you michael and adam what about the misconceptions and what you do about them um one i've often come across is students thinking ion bonding is electron transfer uh, that that's what they define it as uh, at times and that's what they, they explicitly think it as when in fact ion bonding is the electrostatic attraction isn't it uh, blah 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 um so what we decided is that because um, previously we always taught, I, I don't know why, legacy, we always thought covalent bonding first. Um, and then we realized that maybe that fed into the whole, obviously we tell them sharing the electrons uh, for uh, covalent bonding, even though I don't particularly like that definition of GCC. <laughs> um, and so we reverted to teaching ionic and then metallic first and really using loads of retrieval practice and embedding the idea that no, ionic bonding is not um, the electron transfer, yes, electrons move, may be moved from a metal to a non-metal, you get ions formed as a result. But um, spending a lot of time in, embedding that in the suit as well, and then reinforcing the idea of ions being present in metals as well. Um, because that's, uh, countless times I've seen that as an example of something that students simply think in year 11 then regurgitate as well. Do you teach metallic bonding around the same time that you teach I so you do that before the covalent do you yeah, so to yeah teach ionic first um structures and properties then metallic and then we teach covalent um, I've got to say I do that as well because you can then do a really good exercise in similarities and differences as well can't you and, and then begin to bring in this idea about what we mean by electrical conductivity and so on that's interesting um Adam, what about you? What are the main misconceptions and what do you do about them? I think they've been mentioned really. Um, it's hard, isn't it? Because you look back and you think how much of it is a misconception, how much of it is just them not really paying attention. I do think um, I had a debate, I think it was with Boxer or Pratesh about what, what level of detail should you bring into Key Stage 3? 
So I, I don't know about you guys, but we teach quite a lot of atomic structuring key stage three now because we think that kind of opens the doors for everything else. But we don't, when we mention chemical bonds in key stage three, we don't mention that they're the types of bonds. You know, we mention that it's just bonded. And I, and we were kind of debating the um, relative advantages or disadvantages of maybe introducing the concept of covalent bonding in uh, in terms of the, these types of bonds when we draw molecules are co called covalent bonds and therefore we have an idea when we come into GCSE there is a type of bonding called covalent there's a type of bonding we don't know any details about how they form or anything but we know that one is represented in molecules with lines and the other one isn't and you could maybe drop in a bit of giant and I think that might if we introduce some of the more complex ideas earlier it might prevent some of these naive misconceptions kind of permeating through uh, their education. It's tricky isn't it because however we model atoms coming together whether we draw them or I think especially if we use molly mods because I love molly mods for certain purposes but as soon as you use molly mods to show sodium chloride or something like that then we're we're really reinforcing I mean I remember when I did my NQT so this was a long time this was 2006 no 2007 there was a textbook I was using where they were still I don't know if they still have them but the key stage three textbook we had had this lock and key idea for valency so if you had sodium it, it had this kind of thing coming out and it had a, a chlorine molecule with a gap and you kind of locked them together and I, I completely understand why that step was put in but if if you're not careful to kind of be very cautious about how you use it and I think if you if you don't obsess about this stuff all the time like admittedly I do then you the kind of language you use might might help to kind of reinforce those those molecular atom kind of ideas and kind of linked to that and and holding my hands up in that I have all sorts of misconceptions in chemistry um, that I probably know of and some that I know of and definitely in biology which I teach um, sometimes um, there are teachers that will have misconceptions in this topic what do you think kind of the main ones are when you're working with trainees or or even experienced teachers or non-specialists what are the ones that, that we really have to look out for the kind of language that we have to look out for um, do you think I think it's a sorry Mike um, I think it's a massively to do with language use like the casual use of language and the accuracy of language is uh, the major 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 stumbling block I think when even non-specialists or um, you know more uh, novice teachers come in and start teaching these topics because they haven't experienced the consequences of that kind of casual slip of the tongue in terms of calling uh, sodium chloride a molecule or something like that then they don't quite understand the, the kind of stakes they're dealing with when they're talking about these topics. Yeah, I was, I was going to mention exactly the same thing. Um, oh, sorry, mate. <laughs> that's the problem. It, it is just it is use of language. The amount of um, PPC or NQT teachers or even non specialists who use molecule for an ionic substance um, is, is numerous. Um, there's also a lot of uh, anthropomorphism about this topic. Um, Sodium wants to lose this. Um, chlorine needs to achieve this noble gas structure. They want to emulate blah, blah, blah. Um, which is always quite funny because then you get to GCH5 and you go, well, the octet well, it, it doesn't, it can be expanded, etc., etc. And by giving these inherent traits, the atoms that they absolutely must and want to, want to do X, Y, and Z, you kind of feed that into the kids as well in terms of, um, it's making it very, bonding very explicit. Um, uh, rather than obviously there being a, a, a spectrum too bonded. I think specialists, when we use models and when we talk about this is the model of atomic structure that we're going to find useful now, this is the model of how we put the electrons in that we're going to find useful now, I think we tend to say this is the model that you need for GCSE. Um, I think uh, non-specialists coming in when they don't see beyond, they may have had uh, beyond knowledge um, in the past, but they focus very much on what they're teaching and they, they rely very much on the specification. Um, and so they, 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 they then don't see the consequences of, 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 what they're, of what they're teaching. So they have a tendency to say, this is, I think, this is, this is how the structure of the atom is rather than um, this is a model. And I think that doesn't really prepare students so well for the future. 
Yeah, and the, the idea of kind of stability as well, that, you know, you want to fall out a shell because suddenly everything's stable and the world is a, a better place or something, which then again has to be unpicked when you when you get to A level. So there, it is, it's, it's so tricky, isn't it? Because it's it's little slips of the tongue that, that come out. And I agree, the language um, is so important here. Um, I mean, I, I certainly, I, I know that I wasn't careful enough about the idea that, and you know, that, an ion charge doesn't just appear in the, the top right hand corner of a, <clears throat> a sodium ion or whatever you know it's those those little kind of I ideas that that can be um, misconstrued um so thinking about how you teach it in your school Adam you started to talk about how you build it up and, and you start in in key stage three how do we, how do you build through key stage three and and how do you teach the topic once you get to key stage four um, so yeah, so when we introduce it, so we have atomic structure, full atomic structure, protons, neutrons, electrons in year seven, right at the beginning, um, because we think that while it's quite abstract in terms of its size, it's not actually any more difficult than learning the organs of the body. It's just naming things. Each thing has a couple of properties and they have, uh, you know, a relationship to each other, but they're fairly constant. They don't have huge amounts of exceptions. Um, and so we can go all the way up to um, electron configuration. And we feel that by introducing those ideas in key stage three allows the students to see a bit more rhyme and reason when we start talking about, you know, why one thing reacts with magnesium reacts with oxygen. We don't go into ionic bonding in uh, a level of detail and get them to do any uh, drawings or anything like that, but we can say that they are reacting because of the electrons in their outside shell and we can we can make links by that casually if we have a more advanced class we can introduce those ideas maybe going slightly beyond our our kind of scheme of work but we feel like it's something that if they start practicing it in year seven by the time they get to kind of year 10 and they come back to those atomic structure things then they will be fully ingrained and by having a much better understanding of them it's a lot easier to build the ideas uh, of bonding and that on top of that because they understand all those underlying principles completely. That's really interesting because I know a lot of people would argue and probably have argued fiercely against that um, but do you find that they so so I can understand that you're getting the, the vocabulary there and and so later on they don't they don't have that new vocabulary to use. Do you find that they're able to conceptualize that? Do you, are you finding, I guess it depends on the student, but how do you find their actual conceptualization of the, of that, of the atom with particles and charges? It, it, is it something they... Yeah, I mean, it's still at a key, I suppose it's still at a key stage three level, if that makes sense. But if they have the basic recall and an appreciation of their structure, then when we come in, to teach it the second time now they have the space and uh, the kind of capacity to appreciate some of the more nuanced areas i think it really stems from me of the fact that i was going through kind of assessing and evaluating you know mock performance and gcse performance from uh, years past and there were still students that couldn't identify the structures of the atom and i just decided that's not happening again <laughs> I'm not, I'm, you know, at a very basic level, we're going to make sure 100% of our students can get those questions right. So, um, so I suppose there is a kind of selfishness to it in that way that I just really didn't want to have to look at a test and see a kid label an electron in the middle of a nucleus again, and have to kind of pull my hair out in frustration. But we have noticed that it does mean that students in year seven do seem to have a better grasp for ideas. Because those skills are quite, they're quite narrow, although they're quite complex, they're quite narrow. So with time and repetition, um, they, they can master them quite easily. It's really interesting. What about um, you, Michael and Elizabeth? Do you take a similar approach or? Um, I've always, honestly, I've always just thought key stage, key, structures and bonding is a key stage four thing until um, this summer, I, I, probably because I haven't, taught that much key stage three over the past four or five years um, and I'm definitely going to be teaching things like periodic table and things next year so I've been thinking about it over the summer and I, I think that what we do is in year seven we teach about particles and we have all those particle diagrams about solids and liquids and gases and we talk about the particles and the misconceptions and then very little happens with those diagrams 
until we get to structures and bonding. So I'm also um, trying to push down some of the structures and bonding from Key Stage 4 into Key Stage 3. But I chose, I've chosen different things to add them. So what I want to try is using more of the microscopic um, diagram, so the particle diagram, because we do them in, um, in particles and then we do them a little bit in elements and compounds and now we colour them different colours. Um, and at that point, we often do um, compounds that are giant structures and compounds that are molecules, but we don't call them that, or I've never called them that. I've just said, can you spot which ones are compounds and want them to go, oh, there's two colours and they're touching, so there must be a compound. But actually, why at that stage am I not saying, like, okay, we've got two different compounds here, um, and they've obviously, we can tell they're a compound, they've got two different colours, the circles are touching. Um, why don't I talk about here, well, we've got lots and lots of particles of two different types of touching. So that one is, we call that one a giant structure. And this one, we've only got two or three. So we call that one a molecule. So a molecule is a small group of atoms. And this one has got lots and lots and lots of atoms. We call this one a giant structure. And then, so we do all that in year seven. And then in year eight, um, when you look at the periodic table, well, we're looking at lots of trends. But so we've got perfect examples looking at trends and things like melting points, um, sort of differences between the groups. So we've got um, high melting point things like we do silicon, we've got low melting point things so like oxygen and nitrogen gases. Um, that's the perfect opportunity to talk about some of the differences and relate that back to the, the names we gave them in elements and compounds and the particle theory we did in year seven, which actually makes us do particle theory again, which I think otherwise tends to, it gets done in physics, I think, with um, heating and cooling. But um, we, we, I don't know about you, but it tends to just sort of be done discreetly and then forgotten about. So I thought I could use the, uh, the element gases to talk a bit about molecules and why they've got low melting points. And we can talk a little bit about if they've got low melting points, they must have weak forces and start embedding that sort of uh, microscopic, under, microscopic to macroscopic understanding then. And then when we come to key stage four, if that's more secure, we can then talk, start to talk about, so what is it that these forces or these particles are? But I do really like Adam's idea of perhaps using the, it just happens these ones are covalent bonds, not really expecting them to remember that, but just sort of the exposure to the language might mean then when it comes to year 10 and we do structures and bonding, they're not overwhelmed by, oh, there's another word I don't know, I just, I can't. Whereas if it's a word that we have been routinely using, so they're just used to hearing it. But uh, I, I think the particle diagrams brings in another concept that sometimes we skate over a bit, which is understandable that we're expecting uh, pupils, students to go from, um, you know, year seven where they're circles and they just, we're just, unless you're at Adams school, you know, they might be told they're atoms, they might be told they're particles, but they're, they're just circles. And like you say, sometimes they're different coloured circles <laughs> and sometimes they're all the same colour. And then you get to GCSE and the, the jump they have to make conceptually is that one of those circles could just be a single atom, like in neon, for example, or it could be a polymer or it could be you know and so and so when we so for me it was crude oil that used to be where this really came out when, when you were talking about crude oil and the different boiling points of the different fractions and and you were trying to explain that these particle diagrams they've been drawing where kind of solids turn into liquids and and then you get gases and and each of those circles in their particle diagrams could be butane or it could be octane or it could be one of these longer chains and and it's the forces between those circles are suddenly forces between lots of circles joined together and, and there, there's this interchangeability sometimes you're using circles sometimes it's and and the symbols I think can I'm not saying they add to the confusion because you need them but I think you have to be very careful to explain what these circles mean in different contexts and is anyone and Michael, we haven't come to you yet to ask about how you teach it, but is there anyone wants anything to add there? Go on, Michael, tell us about how you teach it through Key Stage 3 and 4. Um, I guess it's quite similar to Adam, actually. Um, we made the decision uh, two years ago, no, um, last lecture, that we were going to teach uh, atoms right at the beginning of Year 7. Uh, previously, in my school, they taught atoms, elements, and compounds in Year 8. I don't know if that's because of previous Key Stage 3, et etc. et cetera. Um, but now the first, very first thing that we teach, um, um, what atomic structure, chemical reactions, 
uh, the difference between giant and molecular substances. Um, and then we move on to looking at, because then we can, I, I think it was either Prakash or Adam Botson that mentioned it, or I read a blog about it. So then you can delve into talking about, um, well, cellular respiration occurs here, it occurs in the mitochondria, because then you go on to study cells, and then you can go on to talk about uh, energy, uh, reacting to give out or take in energy, and then respiration, and it all kind of falls in place. A lot better for us if you teach atoms and compounds and reactions right at the beginning of year seven, because uh, that language then feeds into so many other areas of what you would teach cells and photosynthesis and energy uh, in year seven anyway. Uh, we then build on that by teaching states of matter uh, later on in year seven and the particle model. Um, and then we teach, we reinforce that in year eight with things to separate mixtures. They find that conception really quite hard, even if they enjoy the practicals, uh, before then going into atomic structure in year nine. Um, Obviously, it varies because depending on the ability of the class, I know our most likely year seven last year, their teacher did actually teach them similar to Adams in terms of working out the number of subatomic particles because they flew through the unit um, way ahead of the coinets. Um, so there was space and time to actually just sit down and go, okay, this is how we interpret the periodic table. Um, but yeah, that's been a big change for me, just like Elizabeth and Adam in terms of how we approach it. And there's there's a lot more now that we were looking to feed down into the key stage three, just because, as has been mentioned already, if you wait till you tend to mention these terms and these ideas to the students, not that it's too late, but it's because trying to undo all that knowledge from the seven, eight, and nine is very difficult. And then when you get to key stage four, do you stick rigidly to the spec? Do you do you follow them as they? I mean, I've just read it through to remind myself of it today. I won't comment on it. Do you um, <laughs> tell us about it then, Michael? <laughs> um, it's I'm not a big fan of it. <laughs> um, we we do atoms atomic structure and periodic table first. Uh, but what we do is that um, we teach states of matter, which is in a bonding and structure. We uh, we bring that into. Um, we bring parts of that into, or we'll bring it into, sorry, atomic structure and the periodic table before then teaching separation uh, techniques. Uh, I'm not a fan of where separation techniques is placed. Uh, personally, I'd have it in the analysis unit, but because of um, it being on paper one, we've got to, we've got to be able to teach it if you want to be able to give a, a full mark at the end of year 10 or in year 11. Uh, then we teach structure and bonding um, after we teach atomic structure. But we always teach it as um, I believe Elizabeth and, and yourself make it mentioned already, always at the beginning of year 10. We do atomic structure in year nine. Um, and then we move on to brains all working, uh, quantitative um, chemical changes, etc. I've, I've always considered what we do at our school, we actually teach the rates unit, we bring that into um, paper one topics and teach that combined together. Um, there are areas, as, as I mentioned already, there are areas of the spec that we just rearrange within the unit in itself. So, um, ionic and metallic first, then covalent, etc. Um, but just because of the way the papers are structured, it does make it slightly more difficult in terms of where you, where, where you teach different. different yeah, I've got to say, we, I mean, we, we've completely messed around with it, I guess. So we, we haven't covered paper one before we go on to paper two topics and, you know, I guess that that does bring issues with mock exams. My poor head of chemistry spends hours every year coming up with, you know, bespoke ones. But um, yeah, it's it's. Too, I mean, we, I always put the analysis in um, in bonding and structure in the middle because I think well they've learnt about ions, and so now for me it makes sense that they make sense how to analyse them. But that's again, we all make different decisions. Do you do anything radical, Elizabeth or Adam, or do you stick rigidly to the thing? Well, we're um, 21st century science and have been since certain since the beginning of time. I don't know before my time, um, so it's very different. Um, it's all context led, so um, it gets arranged by by context. So you do a context on extracting metals, uh, a context on a sort of oil. Um, and we've got context, and then you have analysis as its own context or um, synthesis, which has all the rate stuff in. Um, so, but we haven't even stuck to that. Um, we, when we changed, when we had the new GCSE, we all, we all sat down as chemists and we said we really want to teach structure and bonding as 
as a as its own thing because in the 21st century science you do ionic compounds in one context you do covalent molecules in a different one you do giant covalent ones in a different one and it doesn't allow you to do the as you said to do the well let's do the comparison so let's say we've got um, a CO2 um, so a carbon dioxide and a silicon dioxide why does silicon dioxide have a high melting point carbon dioxide have a low melting point and really interrogate those as you're doing them all together so we said we wanted to do that and pulled it all out of where it was and plonked it at the beginning of, of year 10. So we do do a little bit in year nine, which is all the air quality things. So it's sort of they, they've talked a little bit about molecules, but they don't really need to do structure and bonding to, to do that. It's all about pollutants and exothermic, endothermic. And then so they, they then do periodic table and atomic structure or repeat because we've already just taught that um, in year 10. And then we do structures and bonding. Um, and that means because they've done all three types, every time you hit a different context, you can go back. So we would do um, structures and bonding early in year 10, then later in year 10, they've again, we've messed around with modules, but we have a module on extracting metals that allows us to redo ionic. So basically then if you have a group that found it really hard earlier in the year, you basically do it again. And by the time you've done it again, before you do electrolysis, that time is better because they're less freaked out about how horribly abstract all of this is. And then you do fractional distillation and um, crude oil, and then you redo covalent molecules. And then you do sort of graphene and fullerenes when you're doing different exciting materials, and you redo giant structures. Um, and sort of by the time you've gone through all of that, by the end of year 10, they have done it in more than one way. Um, so we keep having another go at it because we did the same thing we thought well this is one of the things that by the end of GCSE they just need to be able to do so the more we can find ways to do it and we're really pushed for time um, so the more we can find ways to do it without just just adding revision so it's actually integral to the course then then the better position they are in yeah i think yeah. that that i really uh, yeah i i taught 21st century science and that's exactly what i did i used to start off with a standalone bonding unit because how could i then go on and teach the you know the atomic um the atmospheric stuff and and you're uh, otherwise and, and the other thing is that they don't necessarily come across bonding and structure on its own unless they're doing the triple course do they i don't know if it's changed now but we just used to have this so i and i like that idea because then you're interleaving the ideas aren't you within different contexts it sounds like a, a really nice way of, of doing it it'd be really nice to see that adam what's your approach to it all right so don't teach the separation technique stuff in year 10 just that they even know it from year nine because it's all in year seven eight nine or we're gonna we're gonna fix it at the end in all the purity and atmosphere and analysis stuff at the end of year 11 i just don't think it's i'd rather spend twice the amount of time going slowly through the actual bonding stuff and making sure that is um that is bang on uh which yeah sometimes that means your mock has a as a kind of systematic error in it so because we do you know we are pragmatic and we do say we'll teach all of paper one in year 10 and all of paper two in year 11 uh it's probably not the best in terms of the like um actual way the chemistry should be taught but i think that practical benefit of being able to not have to uh, worry about the the kind of assessment structures and things like that is is probably worth it in the long run um I think most people, when if they're teaching AQA, they probably teach the structure bonding properties of each bonding in one go, whereas the spec actually separates them out by by a fair bit. I think it goes off on one into some random area, and then it comes back to the properties of everything. Like they, someone copy and pasted it in the wrong. Yeah, see Elizabeth. Yeah, even the mighty AQA can can mess up the, know, the science specification. AQA. Yeah, well, generally it's good, but they've got some howlers like that. Um, the changes of state stuff as well. Don't bother teaching that, just let the physics teach that because it's in their particle model bit. Um, again, clear out as much space in the year 10 curriculum as possible to teach the atomic structure, the structures and bonding and, and spend as, when you're dealing with these um, kind of less confident kind of locked out learners, you need to go really slowly, really carefully and have tons and tons of repetition. And uh, so just try to create as much space. If I'm if I'm through structures and bonding and it's been Christmas day, then I've, I've probably gone too quick even, you know, because they still work, those bottom, bottom ability students won't get it. They'll still need more practice on those things. 
Um, I like Michael's idea about putting metallic after ionic. We do teach ionic first, uh, but then we normally go to covalent. But my, my big problem is like, where do you put graphite? Wherever you put graphite, you end up with a sequencing problem. You know, are you using it to teach, can, you, you know, you're going to, if you teach metals first, that's quite good because you've got the delocalized electrons. And then do you go to graphite and then other giant covalent and kind of bridge that way? Or do you put it at the end and then use it to teach the concept of electrical conduction and say, well, all metals conduct electricity? It, uh, I don't, I'm not quite sure. So <laughs> that's my biggest problem at the moment is trying to figure out where graphite goes. Yeah, it's interesting. I've always done it fairly conventionally and done it with, you know, alongside diamond and everything. But I just ram home the idea over and over again about, you know, three electrons being used for bonding. And But I, I think it's such a really, it is, it's so difficult conceptually, isn't it? Um, again, you're, you're making a conceptual leap between electrical conductivity of metals that they've already talked about and ions and and then you're comparing it to and it's a giant structure but it's not it's actually quite you know and, and then we've got the layers and all those physical properties that that uh, are so difficult i don't know if anyone else got any good ideas about graphite because i hadn't considered that <laughs> deafening <laughs> silence excellent <laughs> that's one for somebody to come back and and talk to us about so i guess you know that, that we've been talking about how visual this is and link there's the language there's the kind of visual side of it that we have to to relate to things and so and we, we've talked about models quite often and and this is a good enough model or this is the model we use for this have you thought about the kind of models that are most helpful that you use and i'm talking that in all sorts of senses you know um conceptual models or physical models like my lattice that i chuck things around the room what what do you use when you're teaching this topic i have a question for everyone as well while we're answering this is it in your is it in your spec because we have a spec point about models and advantages and disadvantages of models that's specifically for structure and bonding so we have to do models and advantages and disadvantages of them which sort of helps with making sure that you pick useful ones yeah i think it's in the separate chemistry higher tier or just a separate chemistry i i remember doing a lesson on it for oak i can't remember exactly where it went but yeah they just have to know that the models are slightly generic and and uh, their strengths and weaknesses to each one and what they're, you know, they do, we do ball, you have to do ball and stick and space fill um, and dot and cross. And it's and, a thing that can trip you up as a teacher and as a student, I think quite often they'll just get a one or two mark question that suddenly says, what's the advantage of this model? And you know what, and, and I think, oh, did I really talk about that enough? And, and that's as someone that loves models and loves talking about this stuff, but still I get tripped up on that sometimes. So yeah, they are there. What are your, what your go-to ones then, Elizabeth? What do you use in this? I like uh, Christy Turner's uh, pipe cleaners and, this is a physical model, but pipe cleaners and beads um, because that, that's, quite, that's quite a good one to put alongside something a bit more um, active to put alongside the dot and cross and the ball and stick because it really um, clearly shows you, you put the pipe cleaners through the shared pair of electrons. So they have to plan their model first and draw their dot and cross diagram. It doesn't really work if they don't think about it first. And then they, they, the pipe cleaners would be the shell and the electrons are the beads. And so you can put two pipe cleaners through the shared pair. Um, and that, um, that, that one's quite nice. And you can, you can um, some of them are simple. Um, some of them then you have, you share two pairs, that's more complicated. Um, maybe more atoms is more complicated. You can yeah. then get them to explain what they've done and evaluate it compared with the others. Yeah, I think I've seen those and I've seen people using kind of acetates and, and things to yeah. kind of get that idea over as well. It's uh, um, Michael, you were going to come in with one there, I think. What were you going to um, Yeah, I'm lucky that my assistant curriculum leader loves DIY. Um, absolutely obsessed with it. So what, we've, got, we've got a lattice model, but he's also a fan of he'll, just to help us with giant structures, physically diamond and uh, graphite, he will create or he typically get kids who may be in attention <laughs> to create a graphite a sheet of graphite and then he brings them together um, and so that you've got obviously you don't want the in between the layers reinforce that seems molecular forces but we can use that to explain to the kids that this is what graphite may look like to, to help in terms of visualizing uh, particularly the different allotropes of carbon because uh, as, as Adam mentioned before 
that's that's something that they they do and just quite struggle with. Um, certain teachers as well have used the acetate model um, last year. I'm not a I'm not a fan at all of drawing dot cross diagrams with Venn diagrams. Um, I just, I feel it over over complicates the issue trying to explicitly discuss where electrons are in terms of modeling, uh, particularly covalent bonding. Um, so not that it's banned in my classroom, but it's uh, solely advised that it's not drawn in that method when we're going through models. I think um, I really enjoyed using the acetate model. Uh, I think uh, Bill got me onto it when I was planning the oak things. I like I like how it can allow you to quickly show a number of examples and it can allow you to quickly build non-examples. It doesn't require a lot of pre-planning because you can just create a few molecules and do it in front of the visualizer. I'm not a big fan of um, physical models. Uh, I, like, I like for much more to do with uh, the students drawing, whiteboards, things like that, because I think maybe it's quite cynical, but that's the way they're going to have to represent their thoughts anyway. So it's probably the best way of me judging if they have a required level that I need them to to get the job done. Um, I used to use all sorts of weird stuff, you know, balloons, all sorts of, you know, sticking them together with straws. and But that was a long time ago and I try not to remember those days. Balloons are great with uh, shapes and molecules at Key Stage 5 though, because they I was going to say, yeah. Uh... <laughs> I, I was going to say as well, if we're talking about the 21st century science, I taught in the long run scheme, there was a brilliant, well, I thought it was brilliant, a really good lesson on where you interrogate models and it was around polymers and you did things like you had magnets and it said, you know, that intermolecular forces are similar to magnetic force in that you have an attraction, but it's definitely not a magnetic force. And then there's another one where you had kind of cold spaghetti that had been cooked and uh, to get the idea of the polymer chains having yeah. to unravel and then you had the crystallized ones with and I I, I don't know I, I think as a teacher I think I enjoyed that I, I did I taught that in my PGC year and it, it I think having taught that in my PGC year from then on I was always conscious that you had to explain that this was a model and this isn't quite accurate and this doesn't go far enough and this is a so I, I think if nothing else that that really really helped me as a teacher the other thing when we're talking about models is this is definitely a topic where I I explicitly model my thinking around Johnson's triangle and, and talk about conceptual levels and in, and link things like the symbols that we use and how you might represent this and, and what it looks like. And however you do that, whether it's just through talking about it or whether, you know, I, I do tend to explicitly kind of draw out the triangle. But for me, this is one where those links have to be, where your thinking really needs to be modeled because there's so much that we take for granted because it's, it's second nature to us and it's not necessarily to the people that we teach. I think that's where um, David Tim and Sunflower Learn have done a fantastic job with their bonding app. I just, that is so powerful for the students to be able to go through the different layers of understanding and, and try to piece them all together. Um, I think that's really helped. The way you zoom in and zoom out, I think. Yeah, you know, and, the, and it also applies the kinetic theory uh, quite nicely. It really helps them put it all in context, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's, I, I really like it as well. Any other real, you know, resources that are not necessarily models, kind of how, I mean, what resources do you use for this? Are you a proper booklet fan or are you, you know, what, what do we use for this? Yeah, um, I'm an advocate, a big advocate of booklets. Um, I use a slightly amended version of Adam Box's um, slot booklet, which he's got for all of the chemistry um, that uh, interlinks with some chem sheets, because I've got a subscription to that as well. And then um, obviously the retrieval roulettes um, for consistently for our starters um, as well. Frankly, uh, Side Kiri, I hope I pronounced that correctly, he's got his website Quizzical, which obviously makes it even easier uh, for teachers to use as well. Uh, I'm now I've become uh, more fluent in it. I love using non-examples in this topic as well. Um, I, I, I think that helps as a teacher for you to completely see, A, identify who may have misconceptions or may not understand areas that you've taught. Uh, as well as understand um, explicit understanding from the students as well. I think that's really powerful. 
you are you a booklet fan, Elizabeth, or how do you? We're not. It? We're not. We're not a booklet school. Um, I I think I tweak too much. I completely understand the advantages of booklets, um, but I haven't. Perhaps it's just I haven't had the time to to to, like, to have a go yet. So I I'm a bit more um, individual worksheets where required or things on the board um, for them to do. Or I'll get my iPad out and and I do uh, a lot of modelling. So particularly when we're doing, for example, dot and cross diagrams. Um, trying to be really specific about how I want them, what stages I want them to go through to draw the diagram, um, and particularly with ionic uh, compounds not saying I'm going to draw an arrow to show this uh, electron is going to this particular atom. Um, so, and and the sort of the stages I want them to go through and how I want them to do it, and then I'll do I'll get, I'll do I'll reflect my iPad up onto the screen and do some examples um, um, that I want them uh, examples I want them to 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 do there. Um, the other thing I think that I've definitely started doing more recently is to do to start with the properties. So to do the macroscopic before um, I do the, mac to the microscopic and then I finish more with the symbolic. So within doing the ionic compounds, we'll have a look at the properties of ionic compounds. Um, and then we will um, look at um, how they're explained by the ions forming a lattice. And only after we've done all of that, so they've got the idea of the lattice of ions in their heads will we go on to talk about um, working out the formulae. Um, and so I try and do as much as I can about, about explaining all the properties and thinking about what's actually going on in terms of the ions before I talk about the formulae, because the formulae is the point at which they can start to think about these ionic molecules. That's um, really, uh, did you, I don't know if you watched Kate Nichols talk from <laughs> Research Head Norwich, she does the same. It's really worth, um, you two should compare notes. Um, Adam, are you a booklet? So how do you resource this generally? Uh, yeah, we're because we're a very large school and we have specialists and non-specialists teaching all through, um, even to the point of having PE teachers sometimes at Key Stage 3, we do quite a lot of booklets. Um, yeah, we, I tend to, uh, I'm fairly traditional, I suppose, in some ways. I think there's a, the power of a visualiser in, in this kind of topic and the ability allows you to whether you talk about, you know, enhancing their metacognition or whatever it is, but just kind of giving them a, an outline of how you're going about solving problems. The thing I like about the booklet is I can spend uh, all my time worrying about getting my teachers to get their language right and not have to worry about do they have the best questions yeah. for the students to do because we've kind of curated that already. Um, I love chem sheets as well. Uh, best tenor you'll ever spend in your life. Um, and... Uh, and uh, so just then it's a, as long as I can make sure my staff understand how to go about explaining everything when they're stuck and we're lucky to have subject specific CPD sessions for things like that on a regular basis then I can trust that no matter what teacher is teaching it that the students are doing the right kind of work and the student and the teachers are capable of explaining and helping the students when they're stuck. So I think you've kind of touched on one of the later questions here, all, all of you. That um, so I'm not a head of department or a head of subject. Um, I have been, but I'm not. And I would be that really awkward member of your department saying, "Don't make me teach from your booklet." I'm quite, you know, I don't want to be restrained by it. So I'm sure I'm not the only one. That, even though, as Elizabeth said. You know, I can fully see the advantages of it. And I've used, actually, I did in the end go to booklets this year, if I'm honest. But but um, how do you get that balance between autonomy and consistency? Um, who wants to come in here? Yeah, I'll okay. go. Um, so this is something that um, I'm quite passionate about. So we introduced booklets a couple of years ago and they were not popular by... Um, by a long shot, to be perfectly frank, uh, with more experienced teachers that know what they're doing and things like this. Um, what we do is we have certain principles. Okay, so I try to um, say that booklets is, is a principle. The principle is, can we make sure every student has a large amount of really, really good questions to practice from? And I, as head of department, will finance and organize the printing so that every student is entitled to a booklet. Whether you as the classroom teacher use that is up to you, as long as you are providing something as good or better than what we've provided in the booklet. And what you find is people start off at the beginning going, 
oh yeah, no, I, I really like this lesson. I'm going to do this lesson this way and I'm going to do that lesson that way. Um, and then you chuck in a pandemic and all of a sudden everyone flipping loves them. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but no, in general, people can then, because I think re what's really important is obviously I've been doing um, quite a bit of uh, work on uh, CPD. One of my roles next year is um, kind of NQT, RQT, CPD. And the, the research always suggests that if you can provide autonomy, then you can build job satisfaction because teachers like to have a certain amount of creativity in their job. It's part of the thing that appeals to them. So, yeah, we don't say anything as a kind of must do. What we say is this provides your benchmark and if you want to do something different as long as it's better than this you're all good to go is yours uh, is that kind of a thing oh, by the way thank you and and i would i would be fine with that as the awkward teacher and and as i say it, it was interesting for me kind of giving in and, and doing booklets this year before the pandemic um that actually the students really do like having something where they know what's coming up and and they, they it does make them feel secure if nothing else they, they've got it all there in front of them and and it really saved on my photocopying time but anyway michael what do you do with them then um I'm not that dissimilar to Adam, to be honest, um, in the same sense. I, I think maybe I'm a couple of years behind you, just in the sense that, um, that we brought in booklets and at first you had some, we're not really sure about using this. Um, and it, it's the same discussion I've had with many people. So we've got um, shared lessons, um, PowerPoint lessons, we've got booklets, we've got, we use Educate for our, um, um, for homework and um, we've got shared Educate quiz as well. And I just state explicitly, yeah, if you've got a lesson that's better, that's fine. Um, but I will be I'm going to be coming in for me learn, learning walks um, similar to, I believe it's a blog I read from Adam, Adam himself um, on it. <laughs> um, and obviously if, if I see, um, I'm not to call you out, but if, if what you're doing, I, I don't feel is better than what you've got available from the department, then it's I'm going to push you. Uh, towards that um, and, and utilising that because it's the, the issue is you don't want there to be a discrepancy you don't want it to be a case that my class answer 300, 400, 500 questions um, in terms of a particular topic and approaching the topic whilst another class answer I don't know half of that, a third of that, less than that uh, how do you then merit the consistency across the department and that's where um, issues start to come in it's not, it's, it's been the same thing because of <laughs> because of uh, the pandemic, um, because of um, me this year as well, I think that's even much compared to last year, printing the booklets ahead of time myself and getting my line manager to agree to that. Um, the fact that it's there in the prep room, um, oh yeah, okay, I'm going to take a set of 30 for my, for my class. Um, you, the specialist, I, I have a similar situation to Adam where I've got non-specialist teaching, chemistry, physics, biology, etc. Um, the non-specialists particularly love having the book is something that's available for them and the shared lessons because I think it allows them to focus specifically on their subject knowledge rather than having to spend time prepping in of itself. And that so you've both that that's really kind of I, I can understand I I never realized how terrifying actually it is when you you're responsible for a department and as much as you view teachers as professionals and you want them to be autonomous um, you don't know what's going on and, and nor should you know what's going on in every single second of other teachers classroom so Elizabeth without the booklet how do you kind of keep an eye on this consistency and make sure that everyone's well equipped with resources well, and so on. I am not a head of science or a head of chemistry so I don't have to worry about it. Um, we all we do have shared resources, we have the, the lots of resources, plenty of resources and something that I have um, worked a little bit on is using the, the scheme of learning to, to show things like what prior knowledge should you be really focusing on because I think that's something non-specialists really struggle with is um, making the links to other parts of the courses because they might not have taught all of the or they don't teach beyond they might not have taught even um, the whole of key stage four so I taught uh, year 11 physics th uh, this last year having not ever taught year 10 physics and taught uh, year, year key stage three physics rarely over the past five years so um, I think I would have liked to book this probably um, I had Twitter resources instead so that was fine um, but I think I think that sort of thing and knowing exactly where you need to build on prior knowledge is 
is is quite hard to remember because you're 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 not so embedded and they, those links between topics i mean some of them are so obvious and i go on and on about you know ions and electrolysis and analysis and and all those things that if you if you haven't got that overview of the whole spec and maybe you don't teach it at a level and and you don't necessarily know to link back over and over again even like you know when water purity you know do you link back to to make these links about ions and so on i'm keeping an eye on time um and as the evil timekeeper mm -hmm. we have um about three minutes left is there any Anything that we've missed out that anyone wanted to just bring in here? Well, we still haven't out. decided where graphite goes. Just <laughs> no, no, yeah. we'll put that. Anyone no. can let me know. That'd be great. Yeah, really. I use that, I use bar models for formula of ionic compounds this year, which is really good. So yes. have a look at that if you haven't already. Um, one thing I would say is make sure that they're really confident with uh, what the formulae mean and are really fluent with what the formulae mean before you try and use the bar model because transitioning, they were really good with the bar model and then transitioning that out into a formula made, me, made, made it really clear that I should have spent more time on that. And um, again, that's, that's a really like, I, again, I before I teach ions, I, I go on and on about the fact that a plus or a positive ion or a positive particle and a negative particle and why why it's important and you know that the, the balance between them and how that relates to a the charge on an ion i mean sometimes you skip over these things don't you that actually isn't obvious unless you know you, you've done it before any other mind-blowing nuggets of information and wisdom before we go not to put the pressure on you or anything you know it has to be mind-blowing and uh, okay. <laughs> well thank you so much for taking the time to talk about this and um, i've really enjoyed it now i'm just about to find out whether the recordings worked or not um and i shall <laughs> let you know later um brilliant have a lovely day everybody and i shall stop recording now